Welcome to week three. Uh, we left off last week with you thinking about inheritance. Um, and I gave you some homework to do to go and uh, have a look both at uh, the concepts of, of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, and what that might mean for this week. Um, but also last week you'd have had a chat about inheritance. I'm not sure what came out of that um, as you looked at New Testament prophecies, New Testament instructions to um, live in certain ways, do certain things in order to claim your inheritance, or live in certain ways and behave in certain ways in order to fail to inherit the kingdom of God. Um, I hope you saw that that's a whole distinct concept from your salvation, um, and that the ways that you carry on in this world may very well affect your inheritance without necessarily touching your salvation. You might still get into heaven by the skin of your teeth, but suffer loss in, in this time in this age. Um, that bleak concept aside, what I want to talk to you about this week is really where the, the whole inheritance thing hinges uh, in Ruth. This is where it starts to get really deep and we're going to have to revert back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy a little bit and there's some fascinating allusions if we go forward to Jeremiah and then into the New Testament. Uh, so I'm going to need to try not to lose my way uh, and not throw a million things at you. Um, but there's some fascinating stuff uh, that's happened this week, which we couldn't get to in the preachers. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to showing it to you. The first thought uh, that I want you to notice actually doesn't come out of the book of Ruth. But remember, we saw that Ruth exists within the concept of the book of Judges. That context uh, is a situation where God has promised the land to the people, uh, and yet they failed to possess it. And it's a, it's a fundamental idea. If you, I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, but... But have a look at how, uh, as Joshua leads the people into the land, uh, if you read the book of Joshua, and then move forward into how they go about possessing the land, you'll see these two phrases all the time. On the one hand, you'll hear God saying, this is the land which I've given to you as your possession. Uh, this is the promised land. But then on the other hand, you'll hear God saying things like, possess the land. And if you don't uh, live in these ways or live up to these standards or worship me or eradicate evil and push out the other tribes that are there, um, then you may lose your right to inhabit the land. You can see how this kind of ties to the New Testament principle of inheritance, that God makes promises, gracious ones. For the people of Israel, it was, this is your land forever and always. This is your land. It's promised to you. But the fact that it always belongs to you doesn't mean it will always be available to you. That's a big idea. But God is saying, I've promised you this thing. I've given it to you. I will war on your behalf. I will work with you. Uh, I will do over and above what you could ever do to possess this land. But you do have some responsibility here. Uh, there is some, some fighting that you're going to have to do in order to claim the promise that God has, has given to the people of Israel. Uh, and we saw in the book of Judges how they failed to do that, that they did a half job, um, that they were tolerating in the valleys and on their borders all these other tribes who should never have been there, Moab being one of them. Um, and so it's a fascinating backdrop to this story. What is Ruth teaching us? If God is saying, this is promised to you, there's this inheritance for you, fight for it, uh, engage with me on it, you know, worship me, serve me, obey me, and then engage your, your enemies on it. Elimelech is the classic example of someone who fails to do that. Uh, he's given all these promises. The land belongs to him and therefore to Naomi and his offspring, but it's not available to them. Uh, there's a famine in the land in, in Bethlehem. I mean, think about that. That Bethlehem means uh, the, you know, the bread basket of Israel. Bethlehem has to do with this concept of that's the house of bread. That's what that means. And yet there's famine. They're starving. In the very place that God has promised would be the source of bread, there's now a disconnect. And instead of engaging with God, instead of resisting their enemies, instead of turning and worshiping them, instead of claiming the promise, Elimelech chooses to leave um, and walks away and opts out of his inheritance. God is so faithful, though, and please let's not miss this. Uh, God is so faithful that he, Elimelech's family still has a claim on their land. Uh, I, I want to show you in some detail how it can be that when we get into chapter 2 and 3, the middle section of the book of Ruth, um, Boaz is still talking about Naomi's land that he's going to buy, even though they're penniless, even though they've left their inheritance and gone to Moab and encountered tragedy. When they return, when they choose to repent, which is essentially what uh, repentance means, turn around and go back to where you should have been, the land is still available to them. The promise is still available. The grace of God is, in fact, not just that it's still available, but he's even set up all kinds of amazing things in his society that would make redeeming it possible. We spoke about that on Sunday. Uh, I'll recap some of that. Um, but God had built into his society 
uh, a situation where, in fact, it was inevitable. If people obeyed the law of God, that, that if Naomi and her daughters-in-law were to head back penniless, having rejected the promised land, having failed to claim their inheritance, failed to fight for their promise, God is so gracious um, that as they take that step of faith, He'd already built it into the fabric of His society that they would be able to claim it back. So that's the first thing I want you to see, that there is this concept of a promise that is yours. Uh, there's some stuff that God has given you, some spiritual gifting that He's given you, some some promises for life and life in abundance that Jesus spoke about. Uh, there are all sorts of things in your life that you have ownership of that are yours by the promise of God. No one can take them away from you, but you can fail to really make them your own. You can fail to make available that which already belongs to you. The promised land you can actually fail to live in um, if you choose not to fight for those promises. Stand on them. Believe for them. Um, and that. I think is worth a quick conversation, uh, especially based on last week's chat and all those ideas of an inheritance and how we can maybe see this playing out. Uh, so I'm going to pause for a second and I want you to think about this girl, Ruth, who starts off, as we said, at a massive disadvantage. She doesn't have a promise. She has been born into a family who, in fact, did and opted out of that promise. And she's a Moabite. I mean, she, she has no rights. Uh, when you th if you think about the promised land, she shouldn't even be there. Her tribe shouldn't even exist if the people of God had done the right thing. And yet she opts in as much as Elimelech opted out. And she chooses loyalty. She chooses friendship. She chooses the people of God. She moves towards the place where her faith can thrive even if she might die. And in that process, she gets grafted in. We are so like Ruth. We arrive with nothing to add. We arrive with no spiritual pedigree. We're Gentiles and sinners. Um, and yet God grafts us in adds us to the promises by his incredible grace. In fact, he'd already orchestrated uh, that it would be inevitable that we would find this kinsman redeemer in Jesus who would opt us in. And I'm getting a little ahead of us uh, for today. But what I want you to speak about on this idea of not possessing promises is how can we be more like Ruth and less like Elimelech? Where in your life might there be some things where you're going, oh, why hasn't this happened? God promised it would happen. But now you're starting to think, I wonder how I might possess that land more. I wonder how I might exercise more faith, worship God in that area more. Uh, is there something I can do? And what we can do pales in comparison to what God can do. This isn't supposed to turn you back into a legalist or freak you out about your performance. But is God inviting you to actually work the land and turn it into the promised land as opposed to waiting for him to deliver it to you? So whatever came up in last week's chat about the things you want to see in your life, where might you be acting a little like an Elimelech and opting out and saying, oh, if God won't do it, then I'm not bothered. Uh, and where could you act more like a Ruth? Like, I'm going to claim that. Uh, I'm going to move towards that. I'm going to take massive risks and make that my own. Right. So let's look now at the book of Ruth. Uh, and I made that comment that it was almost inevitable that Boaz was going to do this great thing. Um, that this amazing story of redemption, this radical kindness on Boaz's behalf, um, that that was, in fact, inevitable because the people of God were designed by God, in fact, crafted by God to be experts at redemption. That he had built into their laws, built into the fabric of their society, the idea that redemption is possible. That no matter how hard your luck is, no matter how far your family falls, no matter how deep into poverty you end up, or how tragic the scenario which leaves you with no heirs for your family, that God had already built in systems that would allow Boaz type stories to unfold all the time. Before I show you just how inevitable they were, I, I want you to notice an element of the kindness of Boaz that you might have missed. If we have a look in chapter 2, um, you get this crazy moment where Ruth goes and makes a sort of proposition to Boaz, uh, invites him to be the family redeemer. I'll explain what that is in a second, but Boaz's response is interesting. He's not taken aback. He's not surprised. He knows what she's talking about. Clearly, he's been thinking about this kinsman redeemer thing already, but he replies, I'm not the closest relative. There's actually someone else who has a more immediate claim. Um, and he goes off to chat to him, um, and we, we, we pick it up in chapter 4. Um, she, she is available. Boaz heads to the town. It's not the town square. It's the gate, but, I mean, it's the one place where everyone walks through, so it's kind of like the town square, um, and gets hold of the guy who was first in line to redeem Ruth. But the bigger issue is that he was the first in line to have the right to buy Naomi's property. I suspect, it's tough to tell, um, but I suspect that someone else had 
bought it off them. When Elimelech left, he would have sold up. So it's still Naomi's land, um, and she still, by rights, has first access to it. Um, but someone else owns it, and so the relative always had first option uh, to buy it back. We'll, we'll see in, in the law of God that it was illegal for you to refuse family members the opportunity to buy back um, their kinsman's land. So Boaz goes to this cousin of his or whatever, uh, relative of his, and says, hey, do you want to um, buy back the land? And at first he's quite keen. Um, he says in verse 4 of chapter 4, yeah, I'll redeem it. Then Boaz says, the day you buy the field uh, from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, uh, in order to perpetuate the name um, of the deed in his inheritance. What Boaz is quoting is this key concept, the live right marriage, which is that if you have a family member who's is are non-existent, the, the, the daughter-in-law has been widowed or the, um, the wife's been widowed before she conceived and that family line is in danger of evaporating, um, then the next closest kinsman has the responsibility to provide an heir, to care for her and to provide an heir so that that line continues. So Boaz kind of reveals that nugget uh, after having, I suppose quite honorably, first said, are you interested in the land without letting him know about the strings that are attached. This other guy says, yeah, I'm keen. Boaz then said, okay, well, if you're keen, do you know that it also involves redeeming this widow and providing an heir and so on? Listen to his response. Then the redeemer said, I can't redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. You take my right of redemption. Part of what's so kind about Boaz marrying Ruth is that she's a Moabite. Um, and according to Leviticus 23, that means that she isn't allowed into the temple. In fact, her offspring are still forever considered slightly second-class citizens. What this guy's saying is, open to the idea of buying the land. Possibly he would have been open to the idea of marrying an Israelite um, and, and the Leverite marriage, the, providing her with an heir and caring for her would maybe not have complicated his life that much. Oh, but she's a Moabite. Not on. Not interested. That Boaz would not only settle debts, make their problems his problems, but do that for a Moabite is just incredible. Um, so that's this amazing kindness that, that Boaz did. Now, why was it in inevitable? What had God done? How had God sown the seeds to ensure that this kind of thing would happen? Let's read from Leviticus 25 from verse 23. This is part of what God has woven into his society. And it's really worth having a read through Leviticus from about chapter 14 onwards. It's fascinating um, as you see, or Deuteronomy for that matter, around the middle section where God is showing sort of society, how it should form. Firstly, it's fascinating that the juxtaposition, one moment he's talking about what you're allowed to eat, then he's talking about how you must deal with murders that go unsolved, then he's talking about worship. Um, it's almost like this stream of consciousness as if God is saying there's really no difference between the minor and the major things in life. There's really no difference between the sacred and the secular. I've got thoughts on all of it. I've got a way for all of it to thrive um, and work well. Uh, and so it's just good to see the rhythm and the sort of style that these laws are written in. Because sometimes when we pluck things out of context, this might be a bit of a side note, but often it can sound a little rude, particularly when people cherry pick our things around marriage or um, the, the stuff that gets feminists fired up or the fact that whatever. Uh, and often it seems like, wow, God is talking about the, you know, what to do with a lady who's been divorced. And then the next thing he's talking about what should happen if you know, you, your ox is threshing and not allowed to eat the grain that it's busy. And it, it sounds super out of context. It sounds like crumbs. Is God comparing these human beings to these beasts of burden? If you read the whole lot, you get the impression that's actually just how these laws pop up, random, and in some cases totally strange, the connections between them, because there actually are no connections. It's just a whole course on how society should work. But anyway, Leviticus 25, the land must never be sold on a permanent basis, for the land belongs to me. You're only foreigners and tenant farmers working for me. What a concept. Right out of the gate. Just that floors me. God is saying, this isn't communism. By all means, buy and sell land, work it. You're allowed to make profit. You're allowed to own some things. So in your own life, you're not a slave. You own yourself. You are free. You are an agent um, who can take some responsibility for the things that you do with your time and your energy. But God is saying all of it, yes, you have some responsibility. Yes, you're not nameless. You're not just a, a robot that I'm in charge of. You're not a slave. But you are a tenant. You're not an owner. 
The person you work for is paying you for your time. It's not actually yours. Your time, your energy, your effort, you are stewarding on God's behalf. Um, how does that make you work? The church that you're in, the home that you're in, the street you live on, the time that you exist in, the corner of the internet that you occupy on social media. Those are all pieces of real estate in your life that you are in fact stewarding on God's behalf. That changes everything. With every purchase of land, you must grant the seller the right to buy it back. So God is saying, fine, if you're tenants on my behalf, here's how I want my property divided. No one ever gets to steal it from someone or buy it out from someone and permanently have it. You must, with every purchase of land, grant the seller the right to buy it back. If one of your fellow Israelites falls into poverty and is forced to sell some family land, then a close relative should buy it back from him. If there is no close relative to buy back the land, but the person who sold it gets enough money to buy it back, he then has the right to redeem it from the one who bought it. The price of the land will be discounted according to the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. You should know what that is by now. This incredible concept, this massive faith step that God calls his people to go on every, after 49 years, every 50th year, everything gets released, all debt settled. Um, the, that you know, weird song we all sing at um, New Year's that we don't understand, all that anxiety, that all acquaintance be forgot. It's actually not about forgetting your friends and your acquaintances. Acquaintance is a weird old translation for debts. Let all debts be forgotten. Well, we're not just singing this like some New Year's resolution. God is saying every 50 years this actually happens. So if there's no close relative to buy it back, if the person doesn't end up with enough money to buy it back, um, then the price of the land will be discounted according to the number of years until the next year of Jubilee. In this way, the original owner can then return to the land. But if the original owner cannot afford to buy back the land, it will remain with the new owner until the next year of Jubilee. And the, in the Jubilee year, the land must be returned to the original owners so they can return to their family land. That's the first way in which God had set the ball rolling. That if a family falls on hard times, if a person fails to inherit their promise, fight for their promise, and in, in fact sells up and sells out, that there is this jubilee coming. There is this breathe out sigh of relief, this crazy moment when everything gets wiped clean. What is God trying to get us ready for, I wonder, by building that into society? Could it be that we would already have this idea that New beginnings are possible, that slates can be wiped clean, so when Jesus arrives, it makes sense what he's actually talking about. I'll show you in a moment just how much that really links up. Here's another way, though, that God has ensured that the Boaz story was actually inevitable. In Deuteronomy 25, if two brothers are living together on the same property, one of them dies without a son, his widow may not be married to anyone from outside the family. Instead, her husband's brother should marry her and have intercourse with her to fulfill the duties of a brother-in-law. The first son she bears to him will be considered the son of the dead brother so that his name will not be forgotten in Israel. That's a big deal. So that when the Jubilee year comes around, that family who should be getting their land back are actually still around. They still exist in order to get it back. The kindness of God to ensure that no matter how far we fall, no matter how far away we walk, and no matter how much we fail to inherit his promises, he is always setting up little ambushes around the corner to give us an opportunity to have a second go, a clean slate. And so what Boaz was doing was simply what he was commanded to do, which makes that weird coded message that Naomi tells her to take to Boaz when she meets him at the threshing floor <clears throat> make a whole lot more sense. You've already read it. You know the, the moment I'm talking about in Ruth 3. You've got this dark room. You've got all these men who marry after having finished the harvest. Bethlehem, the house of bread, is now full of bread again. The ten years that elapsed while Elimelech and co. had gone off to find pastures greener actually didn't avoid the inevitable. We've said this, it just delayed the inevitable. And now they're here, God has actually come to the rescue of his people. They should have stayed there. They should have fought for their inheritance. They should have gone on the repentance journey. And so, Johnny come lately, Naomi has to come back after the miracle has happened. Full of shame, full of regret. She says when she gets back, I left here full, I came back empty. She gets to Bethlehem and can just imagine how people are looking at her and smirking. Ah, you didn't stick with the process. You're just a fair weather friend. So she's arrived back and um, there's this wonderful harvest going on. And she must, she must feel if only we'd stayed, if only we still had land, if only we hadn't given up on the promises. So Ruth is begging on the fringes of one of these fields. 
not actually a participant in the blessing, just a kind of observer, living on the generosity of someone's sort of overflow, which is kind, but a very insecure place to live. And then they discover it's Boaz. And they realize Boaz is a, a kinsman of theirs, a, a relative. And suddenly it all clicks for Naomi. Okay, so firstly, my relatives always have the right to buy back land. No matter who actually owns it now, if my relatives can stump up the cash, they're not allowed to refuse the purchase. That's the first and really wonderful thing. The second and really wonderful thing is, I have no heirs, I have no lineage. So even when the next Jubilee comes around, we can't inherit everything and get all of our debts repaid. Unless somehow I can find a husband for this daughter-in-law of mine. And this daughter-in-law of mine is in a really bad spot. A, she's a Moabites, but B, her brother-in-law died. Remember, Malon and Killian both died, which is part of what the curse and tragedy that Naomi is feeling. Neither of these daughters-in-law can be protected by the other, um, other one's husband because they both disappeared at the same moment. What a dreadful situation to find yourself in. I don't think we can grasp in ancient Middle Eastern thought just how terrible it is to not have a lineage or a legacy to leave behind. So A, maybe this relative of ours will pay our debts. B, this is hoping against hope, but maybe he would be prepared to step in and perform the role of the kinsman redeemer, the brother-in-law who should look after this widow and produce offspring that will actually carry on my line, not his. What an incredible act of kindness. Remember what we read? The firstborn will be known by the deceased's name. So that's everything that's going on um, when Ruth, under Naomi's instructions, lies down in the dark in this room, terrified she gets discovered, terrified she gets found out. Uh, if someone were to stumble upon her, remember how that other kinsman redeemer, the potential redeemer, reacted? A Moabite. Sheep. If it were anyone else, maybe, but not a Moabite. Moabite women were famous um, in, Israel, in Israelite thinking for being the seducers of their young men. That down in these valleys, um, there were these women who supposedly would come up and tempt Isra Israelite young men. Now, I feel very little sympathy for the Israelite young men. It's their own fault, and the Moabites shouldn't have even been there. But in Jewish thought, these people represent everything that's evil and wrong, and particularly their women would have been the ones most prejudiced against. So imagine being discovered in the dark, a Moabites creeping into a place where men were, were working and night were sleeping off the effects of their, their jaw at the end of the harvest. The consequences would have been swift and terrible. You can let your imagination go, but it's not even nice to think about. So Ruth takes everything and the biggest possible risk, puts everything on the line and goes to see Boaz. It's an incredible moment. Uh, just as a storytelling moment, it's such a climax. So what does she say to Boaz when he discovers her in the dark? And she must have been terrified. She must have been lying there wondering, if he wakes up and isn't an honorable man, what might happen to me? If he wakes up and is angry at my impertinence to even make my problems his, what might he do to me? What if I get discovered by someone else? What if I fall asleep and only wake up in the, in the you know, sunlight and everyone sees and, and assumes Boaz has sinned? And this could just be terrible. But she says to him when Boaz wakes up, cover me with the corner of your garment, for you're our kinsman redeemer. What an amazing thing for two huge reasons. That kinsman redeemer thing we've already discovered. She's showing Boaz, I know this God of yours. Um, I, I, I'm a student of his ways. I have seen the way he's called his society to work. And it's beautiful. And I'm staking my whole life, my reputation, my future on the thought that you might actually honor his instructions. So that's a pretty amazing thing for Boaz to wake up and realize this mobile woman knows our law, knows our God better than I could ever have imagined. And is putting her whole life at risk, assuming that, that me as a, as a Jewish man, that I will do the thing that our Jewish God has called us to do. The other thing she says, the wings of the garment, that's beautiful. Just earlier that day, uh, possibly a day or two before, Boaz had been speaking a blessing over Ruth. You may remember it in chapter 2 where he's heard stories of just how wonderful uh, she's been towards Naomi. Um, and so he ushers her into the center of the field to keep her safe and so on. And when she falls at his feet and thanks him for his kindness, he says, May God 
reward you for the way you've been so good to Naomi. Well, may, he, may he care for you. Um, and then he says in verse 12, the Lord repay you for what you've done and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now, what Boaz is talking about there is the very same way that God in Exodus speaks about the way he looked over after Israel and borne them up on wings of eagles. Um, that, that the wings of God or the corners of God's garment, same word, identical word, translated in just two different ways depending on context. That his wings or the corners of his garment are a place of safety, of provision, of redemption. And so Boaz is very comfortable to say, hey, God do this for you. May God bless you and redeem you and keep you safe under his wings. And so then when Ruth crawls in and says, both you're my kinsman redeemer, so according to God, this is what you should do legally. And according to the personality of God, who you spoke to me about earlier and the day or two before, this isn't just what you should do legally, but out of your heart, this is who you are. This is who your God is. He loves to show mercy. He loves to take care of people and redeem their situations. And so there are these two amazing prongs to what she says, um, and I find them so beautiful. So we go back to the kinsman redeemer one. I want to show you how this is about Jesus. I mentioned I'd do that earlier. Um, you may know about a moment in Jesus' ministry where he fulfills a prophecy out of Malachi. The prophecy in Malachi uh, 4 says that the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. And there's this lady we spoke about on Sunday, if you had to preach, remembering that prophecy, sees Jesus coming along, puts two and two together, that wings and corner of garments are the same thing. So if this is really the son of righteousness, there should be healing in his wings. And she reaches out and touches him. This is in Matthew and other Gospels and gets healed. So we have this moment where this lady is reaching out to touch the corner of Jesus' garments in the exact same way that Jesus' great, 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 great grandmother reached out to touch the corner of Boaz's great, great grandfather's garment, all symbolically saying this is how God treats people that there's healing and provision and safety under his wings. I want you to see the other half, though, the kinsman redeemer bit, um, how this is also about Jesus. There are fascinating allusions to that whole law all over the Old Testament. One of the ones that I love the most is in Jeremiah 32. This is a long time later. Uh, at this point, there has now been a king, David, or Saul, David, Solomon. It's all gone pear-shaped after that. The kingdoms have divided. Babylon is now about to attack. Uh, and so we're really at the end of the cycle of the story of the kingdom of Israel at this point. Um, and they haven't taken the lessons from Ruth. They haven't possessed their promises. They've all been like Elimelech. Uh, and so you get Jeremiah, this prophet, prophesying to the people, God is going to allow this land to be occupied. And once again, this goes to this crazy idea that I could lose my inheritance, even though I permanently possess it. It's not permanently available to me. Um, and so in chapter 32 of Jeremiah, Jeremiah's been locked in prison by the king that he serves under, the Israel, Israelite king, saying, stop prophesying this stuff that the Babylonians are going to take over. That's heresy. We don't even want to hear that. In the church today, I think we sometimes do that. What? There might be consequences for my actions? No, we believe in grace. Lock that person up. We don't even want to hear that. So they've locked Jeremiah up. Uh, and Zedekiah, the king of Judah, sorry, Judah, not Israel at that point, um, was not a, not a fan of Jeremiah at all. Right, so we're in the sixth verse of chapter 32. Jeremiah said, The word of the Lord came to me. Uh, Behold, Hanamel, not Hannibal, uh, the son of Shalom, your uncle, will come to you and say, uh, Buy my field that is at Anathoth, for the right of redemption by purchase is yours. We know what that means now, that uh, Jeremiah was the kinsman redeemer, that he was the closest relative who had the right to buy the land from this dude um, if he fell into poverty. He had first option. Lo and behold, Hanamel turns up the next day saying, I need someone to buy my land. You're my kinsman redeemer. Um, buy my field at Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. For the rights of possession and redemption is yours. Buy it for yourself. And so Jeremiah says, well, then I knew that it was the word of the Lord. And in verse 9, I bought the field at Anathoth from Hanamel, my cousin, and weighed out the money to him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed the deed, sealed it, got witnesses, and weighed the money on scales, which if you've gone back to Leviticus and Deuteronomy, part of the whole law was that those scales had to be fair and exactly uh, reliable. Anyway, cool little geek moment there. It's not important. Um, then I took the sealed deed and purchase containing the terms and conditions and the open copy. Um, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Neriah, son of someone else, uh, in the presence of Hanamel, my cousin, in the presence of the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, in the presence of all Judeans who were sitting in the court of the God. I charged Baruch in their presence, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, 
the God of Israel, take these deeds, both the sealed deed of purchase and this open deed, put them in an earthenware vessel that they may last a long time. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, houses and fields and vineyards shall again be bought in this land. You might have missed it first. Why? Well, I think that's cool. Jeremiah's busy prophesying. There are going to be consequences. We're going to lose the land. There's going to be a result for our sin and our faithlessness. But in the midst of saying that bad news, he goes and acts like a kinsman redeemer. He goes and does a Boaz and buys a field and takes on someone else's debt and problems um, in anticipation that while it may be temporarily out of their control, the land is ultimately coming back to them and that there will be an opportunity for jubilee once again, that there will be an opportunity for land to be bought and sold, for harvests to be made. Um, and there's this incredible glimmer of hope in the middle of despair that even when there's tragedy, even when it's tragedy that possibly is a result of us not having claimed the promises of God, that right in the middle of that, we have a kinsman redeemer saying, I'm buying land, I'm keeping my hand on it, and I'm keeping it safe for you. So that the second you return and opt back in, it's available for you. All of this stuff um, is really to, to say that for us, as we look at the story of Ruth, and as you're looking at it this week, that you are seeing this inevitable plan of God, that there are these great and precious promises that he's made to us. And there are real consequences to how well we do at claiming those promises. But ultimately, ultimately, no matter how badly you mess up, no matter how badly you're sinned against, perhaps it's not even your fault. It certainly wasn't Naomi's. No matter how worthless you feel, how little you think you have to offer to God, like Ruth did. She was less than nothing. She was a Moabite. Um, that in spite of all of that stuff, God has set it up, has planned it, has sneakily laid it as an ambush around the corner. That redemption can happen in the twinkling of an eye. And he's made it possible that your jubilee can still happen. That this Boaz experience should be something that we all experience. Um, where we get to say, the slate's been wiped clean. The promises have been returned to me. I have a new start. And then we get to turn around and be like Boaz. Be the people of God who create redemptive opportunities for other people. And so we see how Jesus is in fact the star of this whole Ruth story. That he's the ultimate healing wings God. People get healed in exactly the same way that Ruth was asking Boaz to look after her under the corners of his garments. We see that Jesus is the ultimate kinsman redeemer, that he calls Jeremiah as a prophetic picture to buy and sell land just before it got invaded, hopelessly, knowing, according to Jeremiah's prophecy, that land will be bought and sold again, that promises will be inherited again, that the promised land will be inhabited again. And that really doesn't only happen until Jesus comes back. There is no great um, sort of happy end story until Jesus arrives and makes that jubilee available for all of us. Right, so where does this leave us for this week? Can I ask you to, in your group right now, um, you know the sort of lead up through chapter two and the dire situation that we're in, read chapter three and four of Ruth. Um, if you want to flick back and have a look at those Leviticus and Deuteronomy passages that I've pointed out to you, just have someone in your group assigned to having those things there. But read those two chapters, the two middle chapters. Um, I'm talking nonsense, chapter 3 and chapter 4. Uh, you don't have to get right to the end where the marriage happens, but I just want you to see the story of this redemption. Experience it. Pull out whatever you've heard from this very long rambling bit of background, uh, what stuck out for you, what you enjoyed. And then the big idea. What do I need to start hoping for again? What do I need to possibly stop disqualifying myself from? Earlier you would have been speaking about things that maybe you were being a bit of an Elimelech about. Well, the amazing news is that that's not the end of the story. Naomi comes back. So what promises, what dreams did you once have? What bits of inheritance did you once think were available that you've just given up hoping for? So you start to take that terrifying risk of hoping once again of fanning into flames some dreams, even though you might get disappointed. But put that to one side. Ruth put it all to one side and took a huge risk going to Boaz. I want you to take those same risks in your group. I used to hope that this would happen. I was always praying for that to happen. Let's get that stuff out in the open. It's going to be uncomfortable. There's going to be no solution. No one sitting around the room can say, well, it'll definitely happen tomorrow. Let's just put them out there before God once again. And then the second half of the conversation, where could you be a Boaz? So you're being vulnerable like a Ruth and hoping again. Where do you think there could be some people in your life, some opportunities in your life to do this inevitable thing that in fact God's people should do automatically, that we redeem, that we turn stories around, that we allow ourselves to be used on God's behalf to communicate this amazing kindness to people. Uh, and I think all of us need to live in that tension of being both deeply thankful 
and deeply generous at the same time. We're called to be Ruth and Boaz simultaneously and to do both with dignity and honor. Not super proud when I've got lots, not super ashamed when I've got little, um, but just living in a state of being a redemptive community. So those are the two conversations I'd like you to have. And then we'll wrap up next week.